So many athletes struggle with figuring out life after sports because it's just sports for your entire life. And then you get to the stop moment and you're like, whoa, what do I do? What do you think was uh, your secret sauce? I've been saying the same thing in different ways for four years now. Athletes and AI is creating a lot of like AI powered coaches, AI brand coaches or personal training coaches. Everyone in the ecosystem needs tools to innovate and do their jobs better. With content, um, one of my biggest pieces of advice is like, All right, and we are rolling. Kirby, thank you so much for accepting uh, the invitation to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited for this. Yeah, as we were just uh, prepping for the conversation, I got uh, very excited about asking you, where do you think are the current trends uh, in sport and where sport meets with tech? Because uh, in the mm -hmm. end, that's an area that is extremely close to my heart. Yes, absolutely. There's so much happening in, in sports right now. Um, when I think about how much it's changed, just even in the three years that I've been in sports tech, since I started in VC, I've been a founder for two years. Um, it has changed so rapidly. I would say the, the big things that the industry as a whole has their eyes on right now are obviously NIL and the ripple effects that it has on the industry from a marketing perspective, from what the future of college athletics looks like to how NIL impacts the pros, especially in women's sports. Leading to that, women's sports is huge right now. Um, we always say like women's sports aren't, aren't on the rise. They are here. All the data shows that. Um, I would say another big thing is all the emerging leagues, like more than ever before. And it feels like now they're really, really sticking. So whether it's pickleball, cycling, the new golf league, um, you're seeing a lot of new emerging properties come to market and engage a lot of athlete investors from different sports, from the NBA, NFL, WNBA to kind of get to market. So all around Lots of interesting things happening, um, but it's a, it's a really good time to be in sports. Yeah, and like you are mentioning things that I have talked to so many people on this podcast about, like name image likeness. Everyone talks about that and everyone talks about how it really influences uh, the younger athletes, etc., and how it's becoming more and more important. Uh, how do you look at this concept and how it's changing the game for uh, the college athletes as they are like uh, trying to become pros? Yeah, I think you can look at it a few ways. One from actually an industry perspective, like thinking in the seat of a startup founder or a marketer, it's just expanded the pool of you know, athlete influencers that you can partner with. So before it was the 2% of professional athletes. Now you have so many more options. You have college athletes, you have high school athletes, and it's just getting younger and younger. And with that, you're able to tap into different type of athlete marketing dynamics. Um, so obviously with Gen Z athletes, they're digital native, they're content forward. They're coming into college and high school with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers. You're seeing a lot of NIL athletes on like four, well, not a lot, only one this year, but on Forbes top creators. So they're really kind of creating this new type of athlete that's like a blend of a content creator and an athlete. I think from an athlete's perspective, um, it's created some interesting decisions of like how they think about their college decision. What am I prioritizing? Am I prioritizing sports, athletics, how much money I'll make with um, sorry, sports, academics, how much money I'll make with NIL. Um, it's really not complicated it, but just added new considerations to it. Um, and also it has pushed athletes to become entrepreneurial even earlier in their journeys because now they're having to manage building their brands, um, working with agents, thinking about the business side of having a personal brand. Um, and I think Overall, it has a positive impact. Obviously, that adds a lot to an athlete's plate. But I do think what we've seen in the past is so many athletes struggle with figuring out life after sports because it's just sports for your entire life. And you get to the stop moment, you're like, whoa, what do I do? But now what we're already seeing is athletes are easily transitioning into like, 
a career in content creation because they've been doing it for years. So I think overall it's positive, but I do do think there are some question marks on like how are a- athletes able to manage this all. So that's where good teams come into play. Would you say that it's a fair statement if uh, I mentioned that in today's world, uh, in order to become uh, an athlete that is going to be well known and respected, uh, working on your content game and working on your social media presence is as important as working on your uh, skill uh, of athleticism? Yeah, I, I think that's that's definitely fair. I think at minimum, there's different ways to get to the same goal now. Like before, it was really, really skewing towards on-court uh, performance. And now there's a lot, lots of examples of where most of the dollar is going to athletes with the highest following. And I think even if you zoom out of those athletes that, you know, have, are having like national brand deals, I think it's also had a positive impact on like the middle of the pack where athletes that maybe play at a mid-major school or an emerging sport may before have not had the opportunities with NIL to partner with with big brands or to monetize their personal brand because they're not getting that historic media attention, but now they are able to with social media because they can open up TikTok and and find their audience and grow to 100,000 followers. So I think if anything, it's democratized the opportunity. What was your path to uh, find yourself uh, building a business in this specific niche? Because uh, uh, in the end, you you started uh, as a, an athlete yourself uh, while uh, back at Harvard uh, playing basketball. Uh, what was what was the path from from there to here to uh, basically be building a business in the space? Yeah, uh, I'll start with that. Played basketball at Harvard and really early on, I knew that I wanted to be in the sports business, but I didn't know exactly what it looked like. So I tried different things while in undergrad. I interned with the Patriots. I interned with Under Armour and both of those were marketing experiences. And at Harvard, I share this with all the athletes I, I talked to, like just the importance of building transferable skill sets. And that was something I picked up from everyone around me at Harvard because they were going into consulting and finance because... The advice is, if you do this, you can get the skills for a couple of years and then go on to do anything else. I'm a very passion-driven person. I was like, I don't know if I can push through that, but I do love marketing. Like Marketing to me, I majored in sociology, so it was very similar, like storytelling, identifying trends, connecting messages with people. I was like, I love this, and I feel like if I could get really good at it, I could apply it across different things. Um, so no better place to do that than go to PepsiCo, which is where I started my career. I was in New York for two years. I was on the Mountain Dew brand team. Um, and then I was on our MBA partnerships team and was really just able to indulge in great brand marketing and great sports marketing. And during that time, I started to think about what is my transition from being an athlete into the business world. And I found that through content creation. I started a podcast called Court to Corporate, which was about what it sounds like about athletes <laughs> in the business world. <laughs> Very straightforward. Um, but that podcast, I started at a time where I didn't know what the creator economy was. I didn't know that through that I was becoming a content creator. I was just doing it because Like, hey, this is a vehicle for me to express my passion for helping athletes. I'm good at marketing. I know athletes. I'm studying the space. Let me start sharing it with the world. Um, and that just kind of snowballed into a really strong community that I built around the podcast. And also, um, it really accelerated my learning through that process, researching, you know, athletes and venture, athletes and tech. And I think it expanded um, how I thought about my career very early on. So, you know, fast forward two years into PepsiCo, an opportunity came to join Will Ventures, um, an early stage sports VC firm. And I joined them as a fourth employee, first marketer and helped launch the first fu uh, fund. And that was another great experience that, again, showed a different lens of like, okay, marketing, helping athletes. Now I'm in this, this startup and, and venture space. Um, and it was really cool to be in such an entrepreneurial environment with that team. Um, and during that time, so much was changing in sports, going back to where we started this conversation. 
NIL rule changes happened, uh, women's sports start to come on the rise. Um, Web3 at the time was, was, was coming to market. So it's just all this different things happening around the athlete. And it kind of created this other spark of inspiration again of like, wow, I see this opportunity to, to build something for the modern day athlete that kind of connects them with this world of emerging tech. NIL is just one piece of it. Right. There's there's so many other pillars of of where athletes and technology intersect. And so that's the essence of New Game Labs through through media, uh, through partnering with different startups in the space. That's really the charge to connect athletes in the world of technology. Going back to car to corporate, uh, <laughs> you have uh, pretty much uh, uh, gone that route yourself, but you have also had uh, an opportunity to talk to, to so many people that were trying to pursue the same path. And I'm pretty sure that there are some common obstacles uh, when people are trying to, uh, especially like athletes are trying to transition from their active career to uh, something that they would do afterwards, right? And you have uh, probably had countless conversations about this topic. What would you say are the most common obstacles uh, that you have encountered while having those conversations? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that athletes initially struggle with is figuring out what's my thing? Like, what's my new thing? Because literally our entire lives, we grew up having a thing. Like whether it's basketball, it's football, it's tennis, it's golf. Like we have something that we are purely focused on at getting better at, at learning about that kind of like guides our development personally and professionally through our sport. And then when you lose that, you kind of lose a little bit of the, oomph, you know, the thing that like keeps you going, the motor, the inner energy. And so I always say that it's not just going to like fall on your lap one day. Like, Oh, this is my new thing. Like you have to go out and figure out what that is. So for me, it was, coming home after work when I started my first job and doing a bunch of research on athletes in the business world. Like that's, that's how court to corporate started. Cause I was coming home. I was doing all this research on athletes and business. I was studying about Mav Carter started starting uninterrupted at the time boardroom had just launched at the time, just like studying all these trends. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is fascinating. And then it got to that moment of like, Oh my God, let me start something that shares these stories for a different demographic of athletes for not the professional athletes, like the athletes that are in my shoes. Um, so I think it's a lot of research. I think it's a lot of talking to people and networking um, and just learning about different paths and the industries that you're interested in. So it's just like this mindset of continual learning and continual connecting that kind of leads you to your answer eventually. What do you think was uh, your secret sauce uh, that helped you to build the community of very engaged uh, fans and listeners uh, from the ground up, right? Because I think that's something very unique, yeah. right? Oftentimes you like struggle with uh, pushing the stuff out there and it seems like you have managed to uh, attract uh, a bunch of people Uh, that were interested in the kind of content that uh, you were creating. So what do you think was the secret sauce of that? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I would say... So what, find, what are your lines? What are the, tell me what are your lines? Empowering athletes in the business world. Like literally that's the through line of, of court to corporate. That is the essence of what I'm doing right now. Now it's just in tech and venture, but like the, the essence of what I'm saying of highlighting athletes, of sharing connections between athletes and business, of talking about trends that I'm seeing It's like kind of the same thing. And at first it's going to really suck. Like I look at some of the first content that I published and like, girl, what were you talking about? <laughs> like, What was going on? But it's like, you have to get through that part that it sucks. And then you have to keep going when you're not really talking to anyone and you don't have a large following until you get to those points where you're like, okay, this is kind of getting good. 
like, okay, people are resonating with this. Let me dive into this more. Or, you know, I've, I found a different angle to talk about this. Let me lean into this more. And so I think it's a power of consistency, but also iterating on your message over time. Um, I would say another thing is I am a very social person and I love to connect with people. And I have recently like made a a tracker just to keep (laughs) track and, and effectively manage relationships. But I do think you start to see how relationships come back over time. And people that I've met through my podcast are now people I might be working with today. Companies I've profiled have become clients. And so it's just like having this interconnected mindset of understanding that people move things forward. Like it's going to be people that forward your email, your your newsletter to someone important, be like, hey, you should read this. And then you connect with them. Like, So just really having that collaborative mindset as you push out your content to not like exist in the silo. Like it's not just about you. It's like how your content interacts with other people and can help other people. So many questions that I have right now. You mentioned the tracker. Uh, how, how do you organize that and what what is it? Uh, what is it good for? Oh, gosh. Uh, so shout out to Airtable. Um, my life is in <laughs> Airtable and in Notion. Um, and it's really just by like different categories. So If you think about your life as a professional, it's like, so for me, I feel like I'm always interacting with mentors, with Uh athletes, with founders, with investors, and with people in the corporate world and sports. And I think that the like effective networking is not just like in reaching out to people. It's in like following up. Everybody says that it's kind of corny, but it's a, It's in following up. It's in checking in with them. It's in sending them an article that you saw and be like, hey, I thought of you. Um, but you you cannot keep that all in your head. Like you're going to drop the ball on something. So I just kind of bucket. Like I have everyone's name. I have their company. I have where I met them. I have important notes. I have um, like when I should reach out to them and any action items. Like at a certain point, you do have to put, I think I recommend putting a process in place for managing your network. Um, And then it's also cool to see like, wow, I've met with so many dope people. And, you know, you never know at at a certain point of like, as your career evolves or as your company evolves, there may not always immediately be a way for you to work with someone. And I think that's a, a, a networking tip I would give to people. Like when you are on an intro call, like I don't think the goal of that call should be like, how can we do business together? Or like, can you hire me? Or can I hire you? Like, I literally think it should just be like vibe check. Like, what's up with you? I wish it would be that easy. (laughs) I know, I know. But I I feel, and if if it happens in the first conversation, that's great. Like, sure. But I do feel like the best relationships are often when it's just built over time and, and you circle back with people as like the right opportunity to work together comes up. I find it very interesting because I think uh, like keeping track of uh, your uh, like of the most valuable connections that you have is extremely important because like, yeah. as you mentioned, we can't uh, keep it all in our head, uh, like yeah. neatly organized and streamlined. So if I if I understand correctly, you are basically using it as uh, your own personal CRM with the top contacts yes. that uh, you have around yourself, which uh, I find extremely smart. I have heard from uh, some very successful people in business that, uh, for example, what they keep is a list of top 100 contacts they have, mm. and they basically rank the top 100 contacts, right? Sometimes, you know, yeah. some people fade out of the top 100, uh, new people make it in, but they always make sure that they periodically check in or meet with all of those people and like this is something that uh, they have been doing for decades now so you can only imagine what's the effect if you put a, a strong networking process in place and you follow it to a T uh, because I think that 
then what you are creating is something very robust uh, that will that will help you to build an extremely strong network. And it seems like you have all the tools uh, to support that, right? The <laughs> podcast, the newsletter, yes. uh, the in-person networking game. Uh, so it seems like it's uh, working very well in your favor. Definitely. Thank you. And to your point, um, or to what you just emphasized, content is a form of networking as well. So like this podcast, now we're connected and all the guests that you've interviewed, you guys are connected um, through sharing your ideas and attracting like-minded people that either follow, engage, DM. That's another form of like scaling your network. Uh, so I always encourage people to like not be shy to like start a podcast, not to monetize it. Like you don't always have to monetize everything you do. Like it can serve a different purpose in your career based on where you're at. Yeah. And I think like if you look into monetizing things right away, then uh, you are probably shooting yourself in the foot because uh, unless you are first uh, sharing uh, some value uh, with others mm. uh, before uh, asking for something, I don't think that it's ultimately the right way to go about things. For sure. For sure. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, there's a lot of stuff happening when it comes to new emerging sports. Uh, um, wh what we discussed previously on the podcast was that there is uh, paddle tennis on a huge rise. Uh, uh, we just uh, had uh, an event uh, last week uh, here in Prague, where I'm right now, where we talked the future of sports with uh, MLS and uh, fan-controlled sports and entertainment uh, about their leagues in, in various sports that are purely controlled by, by fans, uh, which is uh, extremely exciting. And just to top it off, uh, I... Uh, totally got into a totally new sport of high rocks. I'm not sure if you have heard of it, but uh, they started in 2017, uh, not that long time ago. It's uh, basically a competitive way of uh, doing fitness, combination of uh, running and uh, different workouts that are fairly easy, but uh, if you complete it all, it's uh, very tough. And I love it. I, I have done my first competition. Uh, a couple of weeks back in Stockholm. And there is just so many things that are happening in, in, in sports. And I would love to hear from somebody who is uh, part of this, like what are some of the trends that you are the most excited about? Yeah, so in the emerging uh, league space, I think one of the biggest things that has been apparent this year is like their strategy around athlete investors, which I get really excited about just given the purpose of like New Game Labs content. Um, so League One Volleyball had a great athlete invest around. Um, Major League Pickleball actually did a case study on that of like how they have engaged their athlete investors to drive awareness. But across each franchise, they've integrated um, their athlete investors into the marketing in some capacity, whether it's social or bringing the athlete to like the launch event, like whatever it is. Um, I think it's cool how you're seeing startups and emerging leagues in general. Think about what does this look like beyond the press release? Like, what does it look like beyond the headline of X invested into this startup? Because that is impactful to drive like impressions, but what are ways to like deepen the engagement and the association between the two? Um, and then also I think with emerging leagues, there's like the media opportunities, like what the Dink has done with, uh, with Pickleball and, um, their founder has now like kind of built a, like a house of media companies around emerging sports leagues. I believe it's called Upswing. Um, and he has a great interview on that. And so I think just even that thinking too of like, okay, now there's all, there's all this interest around these like niche communities and, and, um, and emerging leagues, what are the business opportunities around that? And so I think what the founder of the Dink has done is like right in line with that thinking. While you focus majority of your time on, uh, building up the company and running the business, is there still, uh, some portion of of your time that you dedicate to working out and uh, doing different sports? 
Yeah. I don't know if it's every athlete, but it's like that routine of like workout every day or like five days a week has never left me. I feel like as an entrepreneur, it's super, super important to be consistent in every area of your life as much as you can. Of course, we're not robots. Like we're going to drop the ball sometimes, but I, I do believe in the saying that like how you do one thing is how you do everything. So I see direct correlations between when I'm consistent in the gym every day or five days a week and when I'm consistent in my business, when I'm not making excuses about eating healthy and sticking to like X days of, of drinking per week versus like when I'm not making excuses in my business about like doing the hard things. So I feel like the more you listen to entrepreneurship content and, you know, just people that um, have achieved high, le high levels of success, you see that they have like similar mindsets in different areas of their life. Um, so that's something that I have admired and picked up. And I think that personal accountability and entrepreneurship is very, very important. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I, for me, it's like if I find a way through to, and like for me, like I don't want this to sound cheesy, right? Uh, uh, because we all define success differently, right? Something that uh, is success for me might be nothing for another person. But I feel like, you know, scaling up a company uh, to about 200 people that we have at SDRE currently, um, it's an achievement. We can uh, we can say you know how how big of an achievement it is, but uh, for me it's an achievement. And uh, when I look at that, and when I say, you know, uh, it it took me uh, more than twelve years to to get here, but I take the learning from building up the business, and I go and exactly as you mentioned, I try to apply it in other aspects of my life. Right, so. Uh, one of the reasons I, I mentioned to you High Rocks and what I love about that is that I can try to live like a professional athlete with no risks, right? Because like mm -hmm. I, I'm doing it because I want. It's it's my own will uh, that I want to be working out multiple times a day, uh, getting ready for a competition. I don't have to, but... I already have the drill from the business that I can just take and put it towards something else that I like. And as you mentioned, it might be uh, a nutrition regime. It might be my sleeping pattern that I want to have uh, like uh, very tweaked. And it might be it might be working out as well. Uh, hopefully, at some point, I can also take this and apply it to my personal relationships. Uh, I think it would be it would be very good if I get there too. But uh, I, I, I find it fascinating that there is a big correlation that if you um, find some level of success in business, then uh, you take that and you try to apply it in uh, uh, other areas of your life as well. Um, and one thing I'll add to that, too, is like the I didn't answer the second part of your question of like, are there any sports that I still do? Um, there are ones that I picked up this year and it's taught me the importance of having hobbies as an entrepreneur, like not anything tied to your business, not tied to networking, not something you might monetize on the side, like just something you are purely doing for enjoyment and also like not, not for getting better too. Cause I don't even count, I don't count working out as a hobby. Cause when I'm working out, it's like, we're, we're getting better. We're being consistent, but it's like, what are those things that you're doing like just for pure enjoyment. And I think just given how many like former athletes are entrepreneurs, it's like, you know, pick up a, pick up a sport you haven't done before. For me, that's been golf. And I did pick a ball one time and I'm like, you know what, this might be my, my second thing. Um, so I'm excited for those. Oh yeah. And I, I think it's, it's, it's great diving into new things. Uh, I think for me where I have the challenges that I, I'm very competitive kind of person, uh, and when I start with something, I wanna be I wanna be good at it. Uh, if you wanna be good at it, you have to dedicate a good portion of time. So I'm just trying to be mindful that I can't pick up too many things uh, because then, as you mentioned, from hobby that you wanna do for the sake of enjoyment, right? You don't want this to make a burden that uh, 
you suddenly have to do it five times a week so exactly. <laughs> you become any good at it maybe you have you have something where you want to be really good good at and then you also have something that you do just uh, as as i mentioned for the sake of enjoyment and it doesn't really matter that uh, you are not the best at it Exactly. Even though I'm like, I want to get good at this now. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> kind of made it both. Yeah. So stay it's, tuned. Uh, <laughs> I'm also a big proponent of being able to pick your battles because mm. uh, you probably will not win if you are trying to find uh, fight on hundred fronts, mm. right? But uh, and also like I'm a kind of person that gets bored. If there is only like one task at hand or one particular like uh, area of focus, so I like to uh, dedicate my attention to probably two or three things at a time that I'm mm-hmm. tackling. So I have the variety, so I can switch from one thing to another. Um, and, but uh, at the same time, I'm not spreading myself so thin that uh, I would not be able to make any meaningful progress on. On, exactly. Yeah, pretty much anything. Exactly. Got to be realistic sometimes. The next area that I wanted to ask you about and touch uh, in our conversation is where uh, sports uh, meets tech, right? Because there's a whole lot of stuff uh, happening in, in the tech space. In the end, I'm coming from tech. I've been building software for pretty much past two decades uh, so I've been very close to it and that's, that's my angle to sport, right? On my personal, like, uh, on the personal front, yes, I, I, I love working out and, uh, doing all, all kinds of sport activities, but on my professional front, uh, it's always about building tech to help the businesses and the athletes to, um, you know, unlock some new opportunities in a way. So, yep. so I would love to hear from you. What do you think are the things that are shaping the the sports space and uh, when it comes to technology? Yeah. So actually one of the, I did a, a recap post this week of like 10, 10 big ideas shaping the athlete's economy. And um, one of the graphs is like this intersection of NIL and broader technologies. So it's intersected with Web3. It's intersected with AI. It'll continue to intersect with different aspects of the market. Um, And I think through that lens, it's something you can also apply to like the rest of the sports industry. So with athletes, the intersection of athletes and Web3 led to the creation of a lot of NFT marketplaces, social token platforms, and the whole slew of NFT, athlete-driven NFT projects during like 2021, 2022. Um, This intersection today of like athletes and AI is creating a lot of like AI-powered coaches, AI brand coaches or personal training coaches, um, ops and analytics tool, uh, sorry, ops tools that kind of help athletes operate more efficiently. So the same thing happens across the sports industry more broadly at a, at a brand level, at a league level, um, at, you know, at, at a, um, at a team level, Everyone in the ecosystem needs tools to innovate and do their jobs better. I think thinking about it through the lens of the athlete is very exciting. And that's kind of the purpose of of New Game Labs, because I think people are at the core of industries. This whole idea that like power is shifting to the person. We see it with creators, creators becoming the biggest brands. I think the same thing is true with athletes. Um, and how, you know, it's really an athlete driven era or athlete empowerment era that we live in. Uh, so often you see that people or talent across industries are the early adopters of a lot of new technologies and, um, also the culture creators too. So they can kind of set the trends of like, okay, what are those things that will stick or what are those things that we actually don't need? that are kind of just more so industry jargon and they don't really have applications with, with the fans or with the athlete. So I think it's cool to look at it from, from that perspective. Is there a piece of technology that you would say it's total waste of time that we don't need that and it should go away? What do you hate the most? (laughs) I don't hate anything. I'll I'll caveat with that. Um, I will just say there are maybe things that could have been executed better. Um, So 
for example, thinking about to like the Web3 era, which I, you know, fully believed in. I think a lot of the, and still do believe in, I think the ethos of it, of like ownership, of IP, of thinking about how does talent monetize better, um, and again, shifting power to the person, I think a lot of those core tenets were true and valid. Um, and the purpose behind a lot of the the startups that came to market, I just think that it led too much with the technology, like NFT platform, but the consumer doesn't care if it's an NFT. So how do we think about like, what is what are we unlocking for the customer at the end? How does this benefit the athlete better than a subscription platform, better than a digital product, better than creating a course? And then let's lead with that in the messaging. Let's lead with that in the pitching. So I think it's just like a reworking of of how things are marketed. Um, and I think that was the biggest lesson from the last cycle. Well, I, I could not agree more. And I love when I talk to engineers on our side and they always uh, tell me when there is like a new potential client that w- would like to build uh, something uh, in Web3 on blockchain and our engineers come and say, there's there's no need for blockchain. There's no reason, right? And people want it to leverage blockchain just for the sake of putting the name uh, yeah. as part of the stack. Uh, and I feel like what we have really screwed up in the Web3 boom was that we put way too much emphasis on the technology behind it. Because like we don't like when when it comes to digital products overall, right? Have you ever seen anywhere anyone advertising our app runs on AWS or our our app runs That's on Google true. Cloud or our apps <laughs> runs runs on Azure or whatever it is, right? There are the cloud infrastructures on the background. Well, it would not work without them, but no one cares because what's the added value for the user, right? There is none. And I think that people got confused because they thought that immediately there will be an added value if they say it's on blockchain. But technically, um, like you have to have a good use case to uh, make a good application of mm-hmm. uh, blockchain use. Otherwise, it's just a, a gimmicky use of uh, the name. <laughs> and I think that's what led to us, uh, you know, putting a lot of, lot of emphasis on just calling out the technology behind it. Uh, without focusing on like what is the added value <laughs> for the end user, but uh, like what do you say? I I totally agree with that. I I am a big proponent of the Web three movement. I think that uh, there is a huge power of of blockchain that we could be leveraging. For me, it like the the problem the problem really lies in us not being able to create great user experience around that. And um, I apologize that I've become like so uh, opinionated and uh, discussing this in a, in a greater detail, but I feel like when you look at the overall population, who really wants to be handling their seed phrase to be interacting with a crypto wallet uh, uh, and a lot of us learned how to do so uh, two or three years ago to go through the biggest boom. But now in a retrospective, right, do you still remember where your seed phrase is stored, et cetera, right? It, it, I think what, what, I, what I have learned personally is that like we put way too much emphasis on things that did not really make sense. Mm-hmm. Well, and then it's also interesting just seeing groupthink on display. And like, I was, I was so, I really was excited about it. And again, still am, but I think that's where independent thinking is, is really, really important. Anytime like these cycles come, it's like, okay, what, what of this is, is like sticky and really makes sense. And then what of this is like, 
we're talking in circles and we're like gassing each other up. You know what I mean? Because there are yeah. so many things <laughs> that that we're like, yeah, like this is awesome. And then like you zoom out a couple years later and you're like, okay, maybe we didn't need that. But that's the that's the process of of learning, of company building. And I think anyone that is an entrepreneur like respects that process of like I've made mistakes in my business and not everything that I've done in these past two years has, has been perfect. And so I think sometimes we have to like give people grace to make those mistakes. Do you have any sort of expectations uh, in terms of what's uh, awaiting us next year on the Web3 front? Something that you see on the horizon? Yeah, I think one thing that's been interesting is a lot of companies. So sorry, not a lot. Companies that started in Web3 or were inspired to begin during 2020, 2021, 22 are still going. And they have just found a way to evolve. Um, and so I think we'll see that a lot of those companies find their way with like a new brand positioning, but you know, they have the the tech on on the back end. Um And so I think it will really just be a reworking of like how Web3 is, is spoken about, is marketed. Um, but I still think that we'll see a lot of, of companies leaning into it. Going from one hype cycle to the other, right? We went from huge hype around Web3 to huge hype around AI. Uh, how do you see it, uh, different kinds of AI tools popping left and right? Uh, to be helping, uh, especially, you know, creators to produce better content, uh, produce content faster, etc. And like, what do you think are the craziest applications, how we could be leveraging AI in the next year or so? Yeah. So a few interesting things with that. I think people were nervous that AI was like going to replace content creators and maybe we're too early in the game to determine whether that's true or not because when did chat gpt come out like a year ago as we're recording this um so i think if anything people that are learning how to use it are are making their content Is it adding voice? Is it showing my face? Is it networking more? Is it, um, you know, getting really, really hands-on and doing things that are not scalable with my content? So I think if you are in this business, you have to ask yourself, what are those things? And not be afraid of AI as well and kind of like lean into it and just get smarter with how you're working, basically. Is there an area where you would like to double down on actually leveraging AI as opposed to like uh, doing the manual kind of way? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think areas where it is helpful is in like, pre well, actually, what I really love using AI for is critical thinking. So if you think about how many decisions you have to make as an entrepreneur, or how many considerations you have to go through when you're choosing between, should I launch this product or this product? How do I think about this structure of this offering? What are the different pricing models? Like I have found that AI is really, really great um, just for, for like a co-pilot basically, you know, obviously we all have people to talk to, um, but I think it's great to kind of stress test different things strategy wise. So I really enjoy using it for that. 
Um, and then I think an area is in like content repurposing at least. So if you are a video creator, how can you get more efficient in your process of going across platforms and making sure you have an audio version, a text version, a image version, like, and how can you use AI or hire someone to, to do those things and just kind of spread the reach of your content. So that's something I'm thinking about. This is an interesting point. Is there like, do you have uh, personally some good practice when it comes to producing content and how to optimize it for multiple formats from like text, video, audio, uh, et cetera, to, to make it engaging? Yeah, I think with content, um, one of my biggest pieces of advice is like pick your role models or like don't blindly follow the models of other people. I think a lot of people see something working for someone like you see someone with a big podcast and you're like, let me do that. That's that's it. That's the one Or you see someone with like 50,000 newsletter subscribers. You're like, that's it. Let me let me do that. That's so easy. I just have to publish every week and then this is this. But it doesn't work like that. It's like you have to figure out when what am I trying to do? Like what am I trying to accomplish with this content? For if it's personal or if it's for business, get clear on your goals, get clear on who you're speaking to and where they spend their time. This is a very <laughs> basic content 101, but like where where are they spending their time? And then what is your superpower? Again, are you really good on camera? Are you are you good at talking head videos? Then do that. Are you good at writing? Do that. Are you good at short form pithy content? Then do that. But you have to figure out what is that combination of um, my goals, where my audience spends their time and what I'm good at. And then you have to develop an original style. I think a lot of people can tell when it's not original, like when it, when it was kind of lifted and shifted from something else. And people want to see you do what is unique to you and have you have you have your own style and so i really encourage people to kind of like test and learn and kind of get through that like awkward phase of like growing up with your content where it's like it's kind of good it's kind of cringe you're trying different things until you find your style um and once you find that it's like you have to have systems of like repeating the things that work switching it up sometimes because it can't get too stale. Um, but I think it's a combination of like understanding the fundamentals of how do you get to good content? And then once you find your thing, rolling with it and then switching it up from time to time. I have heard that uh, from so many people that, uh, you know, you can't really pick up a style of someone else, that uh, it's never going to work, that you have to go and uh, basically push for your own style, be genuine and just uh, share the best of you with others. And uh, hopefully someone uh, will uh, find that uh, useful and valuable. Uh, would you mind like sharing a little bit of detail about how you went through this path? Because like uh, to touch back on what we were discussing previously, like you were fairly successful in terms of like building up the community. so you had to answer many of those questions yourself to really define who is your audience and uh, why they should care about uh, you putting up different pieces of content. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so it's changed over time. Like in the beginning, my audience was athletes. When I was starting Court to Corporate in the early days of New Game Labs 2, I was speaking to athletes. I was trying to help athletes get into the business world, I was trying to teach athletes about technology. Um, and I would say court to corporate is its own chapter. So maybe let me focus on, on today. Um, yeah, so like started with athletes because that's, that's what I knew and that's my passion. Um, and so started there. But I think at a, at a certain point in entrepreneurship, you have to pay attention to like, like what's really working. And who am I really talking to? At that point, I had, had worked at PepsiCo. I had been at Will Ventures. And my audience and network were startup founders, investors, and executives. And I was publishing this content about athletes. And they were rock they, they liked it. Um, and at a certain point, I had to kind of let go 
of what, like what I was like, I feel like as, as an entrepreneur, as a creator, you have to like let go of things. Sometimes I had to let go of speaking to the athlete of to be able to enter the new chapter. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm like, okay, I had to make a yes, no list of like, these are things I'm not doing anymore. I'm not giving NIL. I give NIL advice. Sometimes I'm not teaching athletes about content creation. I'm not giving NIL advice. I'm not giving athlete career advice for my business. Like if I want to do it personally, if I'm really feeling it one day, I'll share it. But like when I think about my business, that's not the purpose of my business. I am speaking to this specific audience of startups, investors, and executives. And I have this unique knowledge and insight about athletes. What do they want to know? And so that's, that's kind of the process and like finding that, okay, yes, t- like TikTok is so big right now. When I was starting my company, it was like, if you're not on TikTok, you're getting left behind. Like it's over for you. I was like, damn, I don't need to be on TikTok. So like, I'm like forcing myself to be on TikTok. And again, I had to come back to like, what am I trying to do? Where's my audience? What am I already good at? I had been in LinkedIn's first ever creator program. When I first started my company, I had been named a LinkedIn top voice in sports. And so again, paying attention to like, what's real? What am I good at? Let me go all in on LinkedIn. Again, like, let me double down here. I'm really good at writing because I'm on LinkedIn. Let me lean into that format. I'm really good at networking. Let me build a network and community around my content. So it's like, it's a process of trying different things, of being honest with yourself about what is working and what is not working, and then knowing when to let things go. I think that is, that is, I, I have had friends, parents, mentors, like tell me that nicely at sometimes like, Hey, maybe it's time. It's to time. Move. <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's time to move on, but it's like, you need that sometimes or like you're not growing. And so I always say, you know, don't be afraid to like move on and, and pivot sometimes. I love it. I love it. Kirby, what has been uh, the best advice that you have received throughout your career? If there is one to Ooh. elevate. Ooh, um, I think the best advice that I've received is I think in entrepreneurship in different ways, I've had people tell me like, if you're going to do it, then do it. It can be very, it can be tempting to want to play small sometimes, basically like, like when you, when you start something and, um, you realize either how much work it's going to take or, or how hard it's going to be, or, or you see the potential of it and you're a little bit scared of it. because you're like, I don't know how I'm going to get there. I don't know if I can do this, but if it's, if you're going to start something, like if you're going to take the risk, do it, like do it big. And I, I just, I just like remind myself of that sometimes to like, to not play small, um, to not not let a big vision of like where something can go stop me from doing the doing the little things today that's that is like some of the the biggest things that I've I've taken away in this journey um and what else I will say um I'm like putting together just like a like founder lessons for next week's post I don't know when this is coming out but um one of the most like Boring lessons I've learned is how important consistency is. I probably talked talked about this earlier, um, but it's like you're going to see a difference between when you commit to posting every day versus when you post when you feel like it or when you say, no, I'm going to do a podcast every single week. I'm going to do a newsletter every single week and you actually give it time to work. You don't quit after you've posted four and you're like, nobody likes it. It's over, but it's like, no, you have to, you have to be consistent over a long period of time. And it's like, that has been the biggest lesson from this year of like seeing the before and after of like, when I was like posting content, I was posting a lot, but it's like, there wasn't a process. There wasn't a system. I luckily just have a lot of ideas. So I was able to post four or five times a week, but now it's like, you know, treating it, treating it like an operation because it is. 
and it's, it is night and day. So those are some of the, the things I would share with people. Thank you so much for listening or watching to the very end. I hope that can only mean one thing, that you really enjoyed it. And if you did, please go ahead and follow us, subscribe or write a review and it will be tremendously appreciated by our side. In the meantime, there are a bunch of other episodes that you can check out. And I'll be looking forward to catching you next time.